All right, folks, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed your exam from chapters uh, 10 and 11, the kinetic theory and gas laws. We'll be going over that in class um, shortly. Uh, we're about to start a new unit. This unit begins with chapter 12. It's on solutions. And as your notes state, we're going to watch a little film uh, dealing with solutions. So the first part of this, we're actually going to fill out during class. Um, I don't like videos. I don't like films because sometimes students tend to put their heads down and, and don't pay too much attention to what's going on. So what I've done for you in your notes here um, to go along with that is um, something to fill out as we watch it. So uh, in this video presentation we're going to skip over uh, this first page on solutions. Um, you can take a look through this, see what we're going to be looking for uh, before you come to class. Um, we'll skip through these definitions, they're all defined in that video and they give some great examples um, and explanations um, and illustrations and so forth. At any rate, uh, we can take care of that during class. Alrighty, so where I'd like to start today is with a picture that's found in your textbook on page 402 and it's pretty similar uh, to this image that we have up here. What this image is trying to show is an ionic compound that's being dissolved in water. So these structures here that kind of look like Mickey Mouse heads they are water molecules. Now of course this part of the water molecule is oxygen and this part here these two parts are hydrogen atoms, are H2O. Now hopefully you guys remember from an earlier uh, chapter that water is a polar molecule. That means it has a positive and negative end. No, it means it has a dipole, but for our purposes right now we're going to say it has a positive and negative end. This oxygen end has a negative charge and the hydrogen ends have a positive charge. So it's a nice polar molecule. Now, of course, uh, let's say that this is so, uh, sodium chloride table salt here, and it's a crystal that we placed in water. You remember, crystals, solids have nice uh, geometric structures. The water molecules obviously are attracted to the sodium ions and the chloride ions. Now, of course, the hydrogen end will be attracted to the chloride ions and the negative end of water will be attracted to the sodium ions. Right? Opposites attract. So what you see happening here, what I hope you see happening here, is that the water molecules tend to surround the ions. So these oxygen atoms here are surrounding the positive sodium ions and the hydrogen part of the water molecule is surrounding the negative chloride ions and they literally separate them from each other and pull them apart. That's the process of solvation. We're dissolving this ionic compound in water. Uh, this image, uh, it's also similar to one in your textbook, shows a similar process happening. So, Let's talk a little bit about the structure of water in a bit more detail. If I were to draw the Lewis structure for water, as you recall, we have hydrogen bonded to oxygen and another hydrogen bonded to the oxygen, and oxygen has two non-bonding pairs of electrons on it. Remember that gives, well, because oxygen is very electronegative, these shared pairs spend more time around oxygen, giving that a negative charge. Those shared pairs are being pulled away from the hydrogens giving this end of the molecule a positive charge. So water is a polar molecule. For us it has a positive and a negative end. Now because of this property it is attracted to other particles with this property and as we just saw in our illustration with sodium chloride it's also attracted to ions. Now. Do you think sodium chloride would dissolve in a nonpolar solvent? Now the term solvent is one that we're going to hear about in the first part of these notes. So hopefully you'll recall what that is. Do you think sodium chloride would dissolve in something nonpolar? Well, let's see. Sodium has a uh, sodium chloride has a positive and negative end. Something that's nonpolar does not have a positive and negative end. So can that molecule be attracted to these ions? Probably not. So I would say no. OK. 
okay, the nonpolar molecules are not attracted to ions. All right, well, let's draw the Lewis structure for the iodine molecule. As you recall, iodine is a diatomic element. So its Lewis structure includes two iodine atoms bonded to each other. Now we'll complete the octets here. Obviously, there's only two atoms in the iodine molecule, so it's linear. They're the same atoms, so they share that pair of electrons equally. So this molecule is nonpolar. Okay, there's no positive and negative end. Hmm. Would iodine then be soluble in water? Sort of kind of like this question up here, isn't it? Let's see, the nonpolar solvent did not dissolve sodium chloride because the nonpolar molecules are not attracted to the ions. Can the same type of thing be said here? Let's see. If iodine is nonpolar and water is polar, as we just showed, can the polar molecules be attracted to the iodine molecules, surround them, and separate them from each other? Probably not. Okay, the reason why, water is polar, and polar is not attracted to nonpolar. Pretty straightforward, isn't it? Alrighty. Well, let's draw the Lewis structure for carbon tetrachloride. Now, carbon tetrachloride is CCl4. Just a quick review on drawing Lewis structures. First, we count up the valence electrons. Carbon has four. Each of the chlorines has seven for a total of 32 valence, right? So if I were to draw the Lewis structure, we'll try to make it symmetrical. We'll put the carbon in the middle, and we will bond to each of the four sides of carbon a chlorine atom. And then we'll complete the octets for the chlorines. And if each line represents two electrons, I've used up 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, 30, 32, 32 valence. So that is a correct Lewis structure for carbon tetrachloride. Now, is carbon tetrachloride like water? Is it a polar molecule? Or is it like iodine? Is it nonpolar? Well, there are dipoles between carbon and chlorine because there is an electronegativity difference. But remember, sometimes those dipoles can add up to cancel each other out. If you recall our spaceship metaphor that we gave in class, if we have a spaceship pulling in this direction, one with the same amount of force pulling in this direction, and one up and one down, they're going to cancel each other out. So carbon tetrachloride is nonpolar. So the question becomes, would iodine be soluble in something like uh, carbon tetrachloride? The answer is yes, it is. Why? It turns out that nonpolar molecules are attracted to nonpolar molecules. So, would water be soluble in a solvent like carbon tetrachloride? Well, let's see, water is polar, carbon tet is nonpolar. What do you think? Yes or no? The answer is no. Right? Once again, polar is not attracted to nonpolar. So, we come up with this nice, easily remembered solubility rule. It's all of three words long. It is this. You ready for it? Like dissolves like. What the heck does that mean? Can you come up with a reason or with, with an answer? Help me out here. Polar dissolves polar and nonpolar dissolves nonpolar. 
Now we can add a little bit to this polar dissolves polar um, part of the definition. Doesn't polar also dissolve ionic? Now we're going to learn later that does not dissolve all ionic compounds very well. So we're going to learn some exceptions to that later on in this chapter. All right. Now, I want you guys to watch a demo on my YouTube channel. It's entitled A Super Saturated Solution. So before we go any further, I want you to uh, pause this and I want you to search the YouTube channel for a super saturated solution demo. And I want you to watch that. After you watch that, come back and we'll continue. Okay. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that. It's one of my favorite demos to do. And we'll do it for you in class as well. Now, let's define a few terms. What is meant by the term saturated solution? Hmm. Well, let's see. Saturated means that the solvent has dissolved as much solute at, as possible at a given temperature. Okay, it's dissolved as much as it can. So, for instance, if I had a beaker full of water and I started putting in salt, stirring it up, it would dissolve. If I put another teaspoon of salt in, stir it up, it would dissolve. Eventually, wouldn't I get to a point where I put some salt in and no matter how much I stirred at that temperature, I could not get it to dissolve any longer? Once I reach that point, we say that it's saturated. Well, what is it before that point? Well, it's unsaturated. So, what do you think what a good definition for an unsaturated solution would be? Why don't you think for a minute? Okay, wouldn't it be uh, a solution where the solvent has not dissolved as much solute as possible? at a given temp. So if I had a big old beaker of water and put in one crystal of salt, that would easily dissolve. Do you think I could put in more? Absolutely. So that solution, since I could add more and it would still go into solution, would be considered unsaturated. Now this is the one you just saw the video of. Super saturated. It almost sounds made up, doesn't it? But it's not. This is a solution where the solvent has actually dissolved more solute um, than normally possible at a given temperature. Now, how do we make these supersaturated solutions? And by the way, they're not always easily made. Not everything can form a supersaturated solution. But if you can imagine a beaker, and I start putting in a type of salt, I get it to dissolve at room temperature, then I take that beaker and put it on a hot plate and warm it up. Warming it up, you'll see in most of these instances, warming up as the temperature increases of the solvent, I can dissolve more solute at a higher temperature. So, let's say I go from room temperature, about 20 degrees Celsius, and I warm it up to 40 degrees Celsius. And we're going to pick on potassium nitrate here. So at room temperature, I can dissolve about 30 grams of potassium nitrate in 100 grams of water. At 40 degrees Celsius, I can dissolve about 70 grams of potassium nitrate in 100 grams of water. So at room temperature, let's say it's saturated, can't dissolve anymore, I heat it up to 40. Wouldn't it now be unsaturated? So I add more potassium nitrate until it's saturated. Then I cool it down. Now normally what would happen when I cooled it down? Well if I cool it back down to room temperature I can only hold 30 grams even though 70 grams were dissolved. What would happen to the excess 40 grams? Well we'd probably see those precipitating out, crystallizing out in the solution. However, some solutes, if you cool them down slowly, will remain dissolved in the water at that lower temperature. 
so I might have 70 grams of solute dissolved when theoretically I could only dissolve 30 at that temperature. At that point I've made a super saturated solution. And those of course are a bit unstable. You saw that in the demo. You can add a seed crystal and that can come out of the super saturated state. You can shake it or vibrate it or hit the sides of the flask and that super saturated solution oftentimes will come out of its super saturated state and go back to its saturated state. So if you haven't watched that video, go do it now. Okay, we're going to stop there and we're going to call this uh, chapter 12 part 1 and we'll pick up with part 2 later. So thanks for joining me. I hope you enjoyed.